during this uh, very nice but a little bit hot day we would like to speak uh, with our guests uh, about how um, uh, the city is changing from the point of view of mobility uh, and online services which are popping up now everywhere um, uh, in the professional area but also um, in our everyday life they change uh, transport um, infrastructure and transport system and uh, in particularly in Moscow during the last seven years Yes, we can't but notice uh, dramatic changes in transport system of Moscow. And thanks uh, to uh, Sergei Sabianin um, and the Moscow government, uh, uh, transport infrastructure was really improved. And this um, part, which I started to speak about, so-called online mobility, was also improved dramatically. Now. Um, Nobody, nobody can be surprised by car sharing in Moscow and uh, also sharing some other uh, transport modes, um, for example. Uh, if we could say that we can have this in Moscow, it would be a surprise for a lot of, a lot of people. And even uh, scooter sharing, uh, taxi, um, uh, this is already um, not surprising for everyday people. But of course, uh, there is always um, uh, some room for, for improvement and development. We will also um, uh, speak about some other issues which are, uh, are underdeveloped uh, in Moscow. But we hope that in the future we'll um, also uh, be um, better in this um, uh, things. Uh, today I would like to introduce our speakers. Um, uh, Boris uh, Volpe, General Director of Maximum Telecom, is participating today. Um, Jov Mordovic, uh, General, General Manager of Via Van Company, Chicago. Uh, Dmitry Snesov, um, uh, Chief uh, Vice President of VTB Bank. Uh, General Director of Delimobil uh, Company, Leonid Sisoyev and Vice President of uh, a very well-known company, Tom Tom, Ralph Peter Sheffer. Dear colleagues, um, I would like uh, to ask you now, um, maybe briefly, just five, seven minutes, uh, introduce uh, your thoughts and ideas uh, on this topic, how um, transport systems are changing in the world, uh, in particular in Moscow. And the first question to Ralph Peter, how do you think uh, the level um, of, um, um, of burden uh, on the road is changing and how can we preserve this at a good level? Please, you're welcome. My name is Ralph Peter Schäfer. I'm running a department for uh, traffic and travel information and I want to introduce a bit uh, the topic what uh, Tom Tom is thinking uh, about the uh, change of mobility, the role of connected devices and autonomous driving to drive urban mobility, but also reduce congestion, which is a big fight in many cities. So I, I'm dealing with congestion fighting and measurement for more than 20 years, and I want a bit um, elaborate uh, about the topic and give some uh, aspects how to uh, fight congestion. So the, the company TomTom Tom has built up some, one of the biggest and largest ecosystems of connected cars. We have uh, access to over 500 million connected devices in real time, and we uh, team up uh, either with a uh, uh, service in, uh, in smartphones, uh, in, in taxis, and uh, in uh, port navigation devices, and in car navigation, we team up with all major brands you can think about, um, luxury car makers, uh, we team up with Apple, and uh, so far we have good ground to analyze the situation, but also introduce dynamic navigation and traffic management application to fight congestion and um, give hints to governments how to improve congestion and uh, organize traffic management and mobility. Of course, um, we are just two days uh, ahead of the finalization of the soccer championship and I want to congratulate uh, Russia for the organization. So I heard really good things about the um, uh, organization and the it was a really successful thing. Um, I heard um, that people really said it was the best games in the last 30 years from the organization level, and uh, it was really fun. Sales were full, and so far I want to also introduce some 
app impact on, um, on, on football for the traffic. And I want to start with, uh, in, in Germany, what was finally not uh, doing so well. We lost against uh, South Korea in the last game and we went out. But um, before the game was happening, everybody was on to go home on this day when we played against Korea and you see the impact, which is an uncommon pattern. And you see it everywhere, a few more examples. Before the game, there's a huge jam, very dense commute. You see it here in the blue box. And then when the game is, is happening, the, the jam is, uh, level is going down massively and then goes back to normal level. And you see it here in all German cities, Hamburg, Frankfurt, the same pattern. But then after South Korea, it was over because Germany lost and uh, went out. But what about Russia? So uh, Russia, it was a bit different. It started very slowly. Um, there is very good. Точно не пойдем туда теперь. But in, in Russia, it started very soft, uh, very mild, no big impact on, on traffic. But what I, what I found out in the, in the traffic data, there was increasing level of enthusiasm, and you can now really compete in the, in the course of the first days. You, you, can't, you can compete with the major nations in soccer. So here's another aspect uh, before the major uh, games uh, between 30th of June and uh, 1st of July. You see the typical pattern in France when the game is happening here in the arrow. The gems are going down. You see the same in Argentina. And first time against Spain, you saw an impact on traffic also in Russia. The, the games before was really mild, but here there was a really increasing level of enthusiasm and you see also impact on traffic that we can measure. That, that's, uh, that's really cool. Um, so um, we also monitor the, uh, the final game, what happened around Lushniki uh, on, on Sunday. That's an, uh, a movie. We start two, two hours before the game was over, and you see the um, congestion around the stadium. But when the, when the game is uh, happening, then it's, it's, it's green. Even the ring highway is, is very green on the, on the day. So not much, much traffic jams because people are on, on the TV. And some impact you see here in the closures around the Lushniki, which was temporary during the soccer championship. So this also. Uh, how we can monitor traffic with millions of smartphones uh, of in-dash navigation devices from all major car brands and uh, from taxis, as well as applications um, of, of TomTom. We also measure congestion and um, we do it uh, on a regular basis. Um, meanwhile, uh, we have regular an analysis uh, up to 400 cities around the globe. And what is, what is very interesting, in uh, around 2010-12, Moscow was the the capital of the world of congestion. And it was number one in our ranking and then, uh, had a um, congestion level on average day and night of 58%, which means your, your traffic, uh, your travel time is delayed against the night hours by 58% whenever you drive on average. In a rush hour even it was more than doubling the, the travel time. Over the last year, there's still a lot of congestion. That is a matter of fact, when you look outside, it's still uh, not a good situation. But we see also room for improvement. So on year on year, the congestion level from 2012 went down on average to uh, last year with little improvement to 16. We made in last analysis to 43%. And even uh, what we also noticed, the evening rush hour, which was measured 120% in 2012, is went down from 93% to 90%. It's still a massive thing, but it means you are nearly doubling your travel time in the evening rush hour. But still, we came from 120%, which was much worse. So some aspects uh, uh, find a flute, and this uh, is also um, uh, how to uh, have to continue. 
we also monitor uh, travel time um, on in historical context to give hints where are the congestions, hotspots. We can uh, identify uh, cartels and in particular in which uh, areas do you have typically the uh, reduction of your speed and um, where is probably an, um, a good measure maybe to increase number of lanes if possible or make some alternatives available to reduce the congestion level. So that, that is also a nice tool to, to help to understand what's going on. Another aspect is, of course, you have to understand road transportation because the root cause of the high congestion is we are over capacity. And in the inner city, you can't add more lanes. It's impossible. And then you have to remove houses. So what, what you have to first understand, how much I over capacity? What is my traffic demand? Who is traveling when, from where to where, at which time? And this uh, we, can, we can also do with the, the data to have a good understanding um, how, how we can, where, where are the hotspots, and you have to reduce the, uh, the traffic demand, for instance, introducing alternatives with a metro, with a tram, or, or other alternatives. Because if you have no room for additional lanes, then you have to migrate trans transport to other means of transport. Another measure what was uh, implemented here in Russia a, a few years ago, which has an positive impact on the traffic congestion, was parking. It's not very popular for the citizen because you have to pay, but it can control demand and reduce the uh, inner city traffic uh, because um, you, you, you force and stimulate more, more transport uh, by public transit. And you reduce, uh, of, of course, also the usage if it is uh, expensive. But we can also help uh, people to have services and send them to, to spots where you can easily find a parking so reduce your search time and so far also congestion. So parking so far is also a nice one to help the people, but also uh, introduce uh, measures how we can stimulate demand change and reduce congestion as another aspect. And what is, what is the final target here also in Moscow and we see this has been implemented in recent years, more uh, transit is implemented. Um, we heard this morning the ring train was introduced last year. So you have to make alternative attractive. The capacity is over uh, reached and if you can't build more lanes in the inner city, the only way is to stimulate the attractiveness of other means of transport. And that's the way forward. We can help to analyze the context, but the bring it in a, in a way and an equilibrium, that's the thing of the government and that's very important. So basically, what, what we aim for is an, a more collaborative uh, traffic management where all the means are in a, in a balance and connected car give also good data and uh, mobility services to understand the, the, the issues and fight congestion with alternatives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ralph uh, Peter. I think your major focuses were quite uh, interesting because a number of cars in Moscow region uh, increased uh, by 2 million, especially including Moscow uh, suburbs. Uh, and the data uh, which experts say um, uh, shows um, uh, that uh, we are going into the right direction in Moscow. But the restrictions are not uh, enough. Uh, and the paid parking, of course, contributed a lot uh, to um, uh, congestion problems. Um, and you are right here, of course. Uh, uh, this is, but still, this is quite um, a complicated measure. But in other cities, uh, measures are tougher. But Moscow government uh, wants uh, to avoid uh, tough restrictions. And uh, instead of this, uh, it offers additional services, additional mobility to citizens. And now um, I would like uh, to ask Mordovich, uh, Mr. Mordovich, uh, about this service. Uh, please tell us how this uh, the service works. Um, uh, please uh, speak about its advantage. And maybe this um, uh, service uh, creates an additional niche. Or maybe some users, um, uh, you know, uh, they come from taxi service uh, or from other modes of transport. Pleasure being here. Uh, so what I want to talk about today is the way we envision 
the future of mobility, which is basically re-engineering public transportation. Now, I'm fully aware that we're talking right now about smartphones and online services and exactly how these impacted urban mobility, but let's actually start here for a second. This is how urban mobility looked like 125 years ago. Very expensive, very slow, very inefficient. We're looking at around 20 million horse-drawn carriages around the world. Now, around that time, 1885, a clever German guy named Carl Benz actually, reinvent, actually invented the automobile. However, it took actually Ford to come and make the automobile something that everyone could own with the introduction of the Model T. Now, that was around 1908, and by 1930s, we have around 15 million Model Ts across the planet and only 3,000 horse-drawn carriages. So obviously, the vehicle won. Now, if you look at car commercials these days, either on billboards or potentially on TV, this is what you guys see. A beautiful car, freedom, sunset view. Honestly, the road is for you, and that's what car companies sell. However, if you spend any time behind the wheel, you know that it actually looks a bit more like this. There's just way too much traffic. Way too much traffic. Now, if we step out of this uh, car commercial reality and actually jump into the real world, what you see is uh, not a great picture. We have right now 1.2 billion vehicles across the planet, and it's not getting any better with 70 million vehicles added every single year. Now, this is basically your, your city on cars. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people sitting in a five-seat car, only occupying one seat, and actually leaving four seats empty, sometimes even more than that, which causes huge inefficiencies. However, it doesn't have to be this way. In fact, we do know that if public transportation is good and really good, then it can actually overtake the market. People will prefer to actually pay for the service than to own a vehicle, but again, public transportation needs to be very good. And unfortunately, in most cities, not talking about Moscow, but in most cities, it is not great. Now, a couple of reasons that it's not great. First of all, it costs a lot of money, in the billions. And even in situations, for example, where neighborhoods become more fashionable or demographic change, it takes tens of years, if at all, for public transportation to actually catch up. And to be honest, even when we do build it, it's complicated and sometimes can be pretty frustrating. And I'm sure everyone had this kind of experience before if you arrive to a new city, for example. Now, let's take it even a step further. Russia just hosted the World Cup, and at the end of every day, hundreds of thousands of people would hit the streets. My question is, did bus really change their routes? Did they change their schedules to really accommodate for the hundreds of thousands of people hitting the streets? The imp basically set routes as well as set schedules really hurt the capability of public transit to really cope with, I would say, rapid increases in demand. And that's a challenge. On top of that, we honestly, riding a bus is not the greatest experience. When was the last time you guys jumped off a bus and said, wow, that was a great experience ever? Probably never. Now, the car really won back then because it satisfied the need and desires of people. Our question is, why can public transportation do the same? We started VIA with the mission, with the goal of reinventing public transportation, or to put it more simply, reinvent the bus. Transforming a system of set routes and set schedules into a network of on-demand and dynamic systems. Now, the way you use it is very simple, and probably you're familiar with that. You book a ride using your phone, using the VIA app. A few minutes later, a vehicle will pick you up from a corner nearby, what we call a virtual bus stop. A few minutes later, it will drop you at a corner nearby your destination, which feels exactly like a bus. However, it's on demand and dynamic, which is much better. During your ride in the vehicle, you'll pick up and drop off other passengers, exactly like a bus. However, the routing, the pairing between the rider and the driver, the drop-off, the pickups, they're all dynamic and they're all on demand. Nothing is set. Now, 
Vienna has been doing it in a pretty large scale. As you can see here on the map, we've been pretty busy. Now, we're not only operating and launching our own cities, which we do, for example, in New York or Chicago, or Washington, D.C., or even in London. We're actually working directly with public transit agencies and cities to power their services, to operate their services. And we're doing it at a massive scale. If you can look here, we already completed more than 33 million rides. All in all, we complete 2 million rides every month. And as you can see here with this figure, we're substantially more efficient than the other platforms. One data point that we have on that is in Manhattan alone, Via completes more shared rides than Lyft and Uber together. Two companies with much, I would say, many drivers and vehicles than we have. So I think the two things that I would like to leave you with, the two thoughts are, first of all, Via is the top technology these days to really reinvent public transportation, to reinvent the bus. But on top of that, the second thing is, this technology is here today. As you saw in this map, we're already doing that. We're not talking about something that will be available in a year, two years, or 10 years from now. It's here today already. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yo, for this. Uh, that was a very interesting experience, uh, but it looks like our bus taxes, uh, but we try to steer away from them. Uh, uh, public transport uh, in Moscow is very flexible, and regarding the uh, World Cup, uh, it was very flexible, you know. And the schedule uh, on land uh, uh, transport and subway um, and uh, Moscow Circle Road was also flexible. All transport system was adapted, and it was um, uh, customized uh, uh, during the, the, the World Cup. And that's why um, uh, here maybe um, a number of data is important, data which we get about moving of people. And this uh, number of data uh, is needed to be processed. And then uh, this mobility on demand uh, can be given to a person in time and in place where he needs this. Now I would like to give the floor uh, to Boris. Uh, he will speak about. Uh, his experience um, analysis of big data and Boris now you get this data during your work as I understand thank you very much uh, colleagues uh, good afternoon uh, thank you uh, Sergei uh, that you invited me yes uh, we um, have a lot of data and uh, I can uh, um, answer the question whether it's secure yes it's secure this data is secure in the system uh, but the question is different. Uh, any passenger, any inhabitant of uh, a metropolis like Moscow, he or she uh, is in, in uh, the field of data. A person is, uh, um, is in this data, inside of this data. Data is everywhere. This gadget knows me. He can it can recognize me. And for me, it's convenient that it can recognize me. It's evident that data uh, from this device goes somewhere. But again, I, I agree with this. I want uh, uh, this uh, device to recognize me. And those uh, transport modes, um, which we give uh, and uh, mobile services, um, and we develop these uh, services. And this uh, reflects this modern uh, state of people. Uh, people are always um, uh, inside of some info in information uh, air, um, area, information space. And for now, this uh, demand uh, is continue, continuous. If person earlier did work, uh, and um, he um, oh, could go then go uh, in for sports, uh, then he could breed children and so on. Now everything is mixed. A person can do sports, uh, but at the same time he can create something. And he can uh, write uh, an annual uh, report and he can order a mobile phone at the same time, simultaneously. Uh, so he can do a lot of things in parallel. Uh, this is a new paradigm of consumption. And um, a person moves differently in, in the information field. What is an information field? Now, this is a digital track, um, and any person uh, can have this uh, track. Um, and the uh, person's gadgets um, 
uh, also. Uh, we speak a lot about personal uh, gadgets. Yes, of course, um, uh, data should be, uh, of course, uh, secured. Uh, but on the other hand, all efforts and also European legislation, uh, GDPI, uh, mostly um, is aimed uh, at making um, people invisible in a digital area. I don't know whether it's uh, good or not. Uh, because uh, actually my data, this is my asset. And that is why um, the legislation likes GDPR, European legislation, which says uh, that now my click streams in Internet should be erased, my geolocation should be erased. Yes, a person cannot be invisible. We are not invisible men. We're physical. We want to be seen. And we want uh, to make ourselves uh, visible. The same happens in the digital um, space. Maybe we don't have to erase this data, eliminate this data. We have just to order this um, because um, we need passenger data. If I am, as a passenger, wants to know um, how many people uh, is uh, how many people is in the bus uh, which is coming up to my stop. Uh, maybe it's important. Uh, and yes, and I want uh, this uh, people. Uh, leaves the digital track. I just need to know this information, whether there is a free space in the bus. I don't need the, their surnames. When I'm in the subway, I want uh, in my application uh, of subway, um, um, you know, to have uh, this information about wagons. How many people uh, are in this particular wagon? What wagon should I choose? Uh, and uh, I need an air conditioner, maybe. And it's impossible. It would be impossible if people uh, don't uh, get and give this information uh, via phones. Uh, you know, I uh, maybe I need uh, some target uh, solutions uh, which can be re relevant to me at this, uh, at this particular place. Again, I also have to give the information about myself. Um, I need to give the digital uh, track. Without data, you cannot. Um, provide for person's movement in the digital data. So the data should not um, go from the system, should not leak uh, uh, without an agreement of people. I have one, we have one innovative idea. We don't think that it's right uh, uh, to erase uh, digital uh, data, uh, to e eliminate uh, their geolocation, uh, and click streams, of course, we do this when it's needed. But I think um, uh, it eliminates uh, some kind of value of my data, because my data is my value. And uh, maybe it's possible uh, that um, uh, that um, maybe uh, uh, there will be no, uh, maybe there will be another step. Um, we think about this a lot. Perhaps uh, a, a, a personal a, a personal room uh, will be created, and this room uh, will uh, belong uh, to a passenger. It will be secured. It will be safeguarded, and then all my data uh, will be saved. Uh, data about my click streams, my insurance, my mortgage, uh, my uh, penalties, uh, my. Uh, subway and so on, subway trips, uh, medical uh, certificates. And this will be my asset. If uh, we can do this um, in the system like blockchain, uh, I myself uh, uh, can uh, I'm, I myself can open some data to some counter agents. Uh, for example, I can give data about my movements uh, uh, to transport system because I want to be considered. Uh, to be thought of, um, because I, I want to participate. Um, maybe, maybe I will not, um, you know, disclose my medical information, because I don't want it. For example, um, but still, uh, I will have this data myself, um, and they will have some market value, maybe. So, but uh, when uh, I want uh, to give some information, I can get even good financial proposal, uh, like, uh, for example, uh, loyalty card uh, from transport system, some other retail proposals. They can be a credible space uh, of data which can provide for full-fledged um, services. 
and uh, quality services, relevant services, and uh, safe services. Thank you very much. Thank you. Boris, you were so enthusiastic uh, about what you were saying as you convinced almost all here in uh, safety of uh, data. In your case, when you get somebody's data automatically, uh, the device that gives you this comfort needs to know something about you so that automatically in advance some service could be provided to this person. Uh, freeing this person from some routine, boring uh, tasks that they have to repeat and again, ag uh, repeat again and again, and and we, you convinced us that it's safe. Uh, we can entrust to the big brother our finances, and here we have uh, Dmitry Snesser from VTB Bank telling us about the novelties in uh, financing. Colleagues, I listen to others, and I don't want to repeat uh, uh, trivialities that we already heard. I will just very briefly tell you about how mobility changed my life, in particular, if you don't mind. Any mobility, we understand we live in um, the mobile world, and any mobility, what's the driver of it? First of all, it's based on our consumption. We human beings consume things. We live in post-industrial society and here in Russia as well. And if you consume something, you have to pay for it. At the end of any mobility, there is a bank, your visa card, your wallet, your uh, other payment system. Accordingly, mobility in the city mean means uh, payments, communication, knowledge. We want it to be done uh, fast. We want to get a certain service or product at the right time, at the right price, at the right location where we want it. Accordingly, about movements, just a few words. A few uh, years ago, people were trying to uh, stop a taxi in the street. If I show my kids uh, a, a person trying to flag down a car in the street, they wouldn't understand what, what's that about. And I saw something like that a couple of days ago, and I got surprised. Uh, there are discussions about uh, all these different um, applications about taxis and everyone is used to them. But now how banks changed our mobility, including my own. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we were all visiting banks. We had to sign things, withdraw things, send things out to other places. A couple of days ago, when we had some delays with the work of our website, I don't think anybody still went to the physical branch to to uh, make any transactions. Nobody went to banks, uh, and and even now people don't go to and from the bank. We r removed some of the load from the transportation uh, routes of the city, and not just our bank, all banks. When we talk about uh, using metro in public transport, a couple of years ago at this forum, I said when I came to Moscow as a boy, I really enjoyed five copic coins that we had to use to pay uh, for um, metro. After that, after those coins that were used as tokens, we got tickets and electronic tickets, and how we go through turnstiles in the metro now. You have uh, plastic cards. We had. We also have contactless uh, means of payment. By the way, in June, we won the tender of the metro and began to deploy our contactless payment machines. 
until the end of the year at 211 metro stations, you will be able to pay for your metro uh, fare using cards if you have if you have no Troika cards. And you can pay with your card or with your coins that you have in uh, your pocket to buy a ticket. Contactless uh, payment has been implemented at the Moscow Central Circle. 47 routes of the Moscow transportation uh, system, 610 vehicles, and uh, we plan to cover all 800 of them, or 800 routes. And now, futurologists uh, scare us with different things. Now, a few words about evolution of payment. Our colleague from Germany may correct me if I'm wrong, but in, in Frankfurt, they have no turnstiles at all. In uh, public transport, people buy tickets, and everyone believes them that they really paid. And if a controller or inspector uh, catches someone, they pay a fine. I used to visit uh, a football game recently, and I can only thank the Moscow Metro and the city of Moscow for allowing the fans to use the Metro for free. And this huge uh, crowd was going through turnstiles without stopping. And, uh, and in the future, it'll be facial recognition. And it's, uh, it could look like sci-fi now, but we'll, we'll be there pretty soon. Of course, we cannot avoid control altogether like they did in Germany. All futurologists at such uh, forums scare us that banks will be pushed out of uh, the market by high-tech companies and the like. But we are taking measures against that. We are developing this uh, smart city program what it means and what you can get there. You can uh, deposit money to your Troika uh, cards. Uh, you can order a taxi. And you can pay for your parking. You can pay your fines, uh, government funds, uh, traffic fines. That's what everybody does. Your culture and geolocation and announcements and tickets. You could also add big data here, a personalization of commercial and push-ups from many different suppliers of services. That's another part of the project. And active citizen is what we are going to do. You'll be present on that platform. Thank you, Dmitry. As for turnstiles, a decision has been made about Moscow to abandon or remove all, all turnstiles in uh, our transport here in Moscow. So all these solutions about contactless payment will be in uh, uh, demand. That's what our residents need right now. And of course, all systems of online payments when you fine tune these things to be done automatically so that you would get money on your account automatically. It's all very com convenient. And some may be cautious about it, uh, whether they can trust others with their money. But sooner or later, people understand that that's their comfort, their additional free time, and an opportunity for them to do what they want, not what they have to do. And that's where the future is. And now, finally, let me give the floor to Leonid Sesoyev. Tell us, from Delhi Mobile, you recently offered a new type of urban mobility. 
this is uh, a leasing out of uh, Uh, um, bicycles and uh, and scooters but uh, how did you get this idea let me give uh, two uh, questions to or two riddles to the whole here. Which business we are going to get in uh, in 10 years? Another riddle. I'm going to talk about scooters and, you know, those push stand-up scooters that kids have. And why am I talking? Why have I brought this uh, case with me? What is in the half of that briefcase? At, at the end of my presentation, we will uh, find answers to this together. OK. We have this uh, uh, rent a push stand-up scooter program. We looked at Asia, and we realized that for the city, uh, we need environmental green type of transportation, which would be light enough and not requiring any specific uh, any uh, mode of transport, and it's a kick scooter or. And, but in reality, it's actually an electric scooter. We uh, tested it. We realized it was viable even in winter. Of course, we don't call, uh, we don't insist on using it in winter. It's not a studded tires anyway. It may not be very comfortable in winter, but anyway, we have quite a few tasks. The uh, city wants to deal with this problem of the last mile so that the person from the suburb wouldn't have to make any difficult decisions about how to get to the city center, whether they use uh, car sharing or personal car or using by metro or using metro, they, but they need to get to, met, to the metro. Uh, of course, uh, street cars are good uh, with uh, low uh, frame and comfortable, but that's what we are doing. We have these kick scooter uh, stations, and then people can get the scooter, reach the metro station, uh, fold it, get into the metro station because it's allowed when it's folded, uh, and then get to their office. This turned out to be a viable model. We were able to do that by the World Cup, and many of our guests and foreigners who rented their kick scooters to deal with their uh, transportation needs. And after this brief period, we can see that s these uh, kick scooters are used for uh, to deal with their transportation needs. And in 30% of cases, that's for recreational purposes, for an hour, for uh, a day, for a week, to go through a historic uh, center. And we understand it's a convenient uh, means of transport. It's all done through a mobile application. You can find the uh, kick scooter that's available. Then you use it, and then you put it back into the stand. And here, we all have smartphones. And as we analyzed our clients, I can give you a customer journey of our clients. In the morning when uh, they wake up, they already have a certain uh, site where this person needs to walk 
their dog. It's this dog has a uh, chipped dog, and that's a certain type of society. Then they come back home, they uh, rent a car sharing vehicle or a taxi, and then they go to the metro or to another point. On the way, they get signals from points of interest offering them uh, some special offers, and they record this location because of the special offer. Then they pass through or nearby a uh, hospital or uh, drugstore. And of course, uh, people need experience in using phones. Then this person uh, gets a 50% discount for the traffic fine that he got after using uh, car sharing. And then for this entire period, they are escorted by this phone and the mobile opportunities that they have with the current infrastructure. There are, of course, nuances. Sometimes uh, the system gets frozen. And there's another special riddle that's in my briefcase. I hope you can guess what I have in my uh, briefcase. A kick scooter, no. It's a good uh, attempt, but it's not that. What else do I need to make me mobile? By the way, I gave a personal example earlier. I uh, lack digital car license. I don't want to carry my passport or my physical license with me. It would be ideal if it would be in my phone. But still, there is something in my briefcase that you need to guess, occupying half of it. We live in a big city. We want to move efficiently. If in the past, a couple of decades ago, when I was a boy, I enjoyed also using that special machine that gave me three five copic coins uh, for a 15 copic coin or four uh, five copic coins for coins for one 20 copic coin. That was the magic. And now, it's uh, very nice in the metro when they have unusual style decorating the metro cars, uh, whole cars uh, decorated with paintings, for example, or special themes. And if somebody says it's hot in the metro, we have some issues even in this building with air conditioning. It's not that bad. Uh, I don't need a uh, sauna uh, today. And so to answer my first riddle, what, which business will come up in 10 uh, years? And what's left in my briefcase after I throw away my passport and my, and my uh, driving license? I'm talking about the power bank. I have to carry two or three power banks with me not to lose everything at the wrong moment. And about which business will come up in 10 years? Let's be more philosophical about it. The entire evolution was from the analog world and the Neanderthal man was uh, uh, changing. And sometimes we have a feeling that we miss that past. I am a pioneer and supporter of the digital world. But I have this prediction that there will be a business of uh, analog digit uh, free uh, area for the new generations it will be why uh, a very attractive idea that there will be some 
special territories where there will be no digital signals and they will not be allowed to use phones in those areas and there for people born uh, the digital age they will be getting this new analog experience it you need it to develop uh, the digital world even further if we focus on uh, digitization alone we will lose what we call souls and uh, even machines have souls because people worked on them okay now we have we're in this discussion about uh, those warm feelings uh, about things that we did in the past i like to thank our guests for their interesting presentations we have about five minutes i can take a couple of questions from the audience if there are any do we have any questions to our guests uh, this afternoon please pass the microphone to whoever raised their hand i'm from uh, russian gazette my question is uh, to Leonid Sasayev about the kick scooters. There was this uh, survey in the Telegram program. The users believe your kick scooters are too expensive, and you raised prices recently. That's the main problem. And the second question from those users is that the system of registration is too hard. I spent an hour and a half to make an arrangement with your promoters. What you are telling us is great, but you need to optimize these processes so it's easy and not as expensive as it is now. What is your excuse, Leonid? Thank you for mentioning both of our businesses, Delhi Scooter and Delhi Mobile. The uh, idea of having promoters was uh, uh, deliberate. We, they needed an explanation about how to use it. The analog kind of communication is still important. When many of our people, 35 plus, in terms, they they would rent this electric scooter from us. They kept kicking and pushing even though the scooter was electric. And our registration system is automatic. And uh, daily mobile clients get an automatic registration with uh, uh, but yeah, I admit, in the beginning, there were some delays. When you have a startup, you have to fine-tune your process. Now, if you are a new client, you have to spend 15 minutes for registration. If you are a daily mobile client, you will get your uh, scooter immediately. If you didn't do it, you can do it on site. As for the price, the price uh, depends on uh, economics and its relative yesterday the day before yesterday all our scooters in the city center were rented so as you can see for some people that price is good enough three years ago we only had one car sharing company in the country now there are 15 of them uh, with all types of cars expensive and inexpensive according to everyone's needs so it's not a problem there is a young service and now there are three companies already that uh, lease out uh, scooters so there is a future here and let's see if we have any more questions. All right. I'm told that I need to wrap it up. And I'd like to thank our guests for their interesting opinions and 
uh, how they uh, view the situation. And some of us will have to uh, accept or welcome the changes that uh, are happening in the transportation segment of the capital. And soon uh, we'll be able to choose routes for every individual user, whether they rent a scooter, leave it, get on the metro train, leave the metro, uh, hire a car sharing car and get a car sharing car and all of them will find their user. Thank you for your interesting opinions. We discussed many different topics today. I think that we will all have our own opinions about it and that was the most important task of our meeting. I'd like to thank our guests again and goodbye.